Um, so I'm Kai. I organize the Bay Area D3 user group um, with a couple friends. We all sort of organize it off the D3 mailing list. Um, and I am a design technologist at Stamen Design. Um, and I have some, uh, I don't have slides because I am going to um, sort of open these interactive examples and, and play with them and talk about them. Um, but the links are at uh, bl.ocks.org slash syntagmatic, um, which is my GitHub username. And it's this first uh, bids data science lecture notes. Um, I have a couple projects on here that you could explore. Um, but really, I won't just kind of want to get into uh, D3 and what it's all about and how you can use it to visualize, um, especially in this talk, multidimensional data. So data where you have um, more than three uh, dimensions or attributes uh, on each data point. Um, so really quick, let me just give a couple D3 resources because D3 is just a uh, sort of many things. It's a JavaScript library. It's also kind of this. Oh. Yeah, it's hard to hear you over the yelling. <laughs> Hold on, we'll, we'll enable it. Testing, testing. Testing, no. Nope. Testing, testing. OK, great. Um, so D3 is, uh, well, well, D3 was created by Mike Vosak. And I will talk about um, sort of my progression through one visualization, which goes back to Protoviz, which was the sort of predecessor framework to D3. And Protoviz is sort of inspired by ggplot, um, if you are familiar with R. Um, so Mike Bostek is the creator. He's um, sort of, I think, been many years of kind of uh, distilling just his, his insight into how browsers work um, and how to create um, interactive visualization in the browser. Uh, he's, uh, there's dozens of interactive examples on this first link. Um, many of these are essays designed for people um, learning interactive visualization. So they're pedagogical examples. Some of them are um, articles that were published in the New York Times um, where he works. He has a huge example, a huge um, sort of gallery of very simple examples. Um, he created the service blocks.org, which um, lets you post GitHub GIS, which is, uh, they're just little simple, uh, little HTML files. And um, these are also just simple examples that are designed to showcase uh, one or several techniques. Um, almost all of them use D3. And you can kind of, and the way I encourage people to learn is sort of browse this and find something uh, you're interested in and sort of bring it closer to your data or change it in some way that uh, you find interesting. There, there are examples of, of interesting geometries and topologies. Um, force layouts, uh, hierarchical layouts, dendrograms, tree maps, uh, parallel coordinates, which I will talk about, um, all kinds of labeling techniques, uh, cartographic techniques. Um, it's just a really incredible body of work. Yeah. So some people say D3 is too much. They can't take it all in, and it has a complicated and twisted style. Um, Yeah, you, you'll always be using a, su a subset of it. It's, it is incredibly hard to learn the whole thing at once. So, uh, so that's why I, I sort of encourage people to find just, just a, one example that they're interested in and really understand how that one example works and try to change parts of it. Because you really have to learn it a bit at a time. Um, because, you know, like there's, there's all these geographic components and, and ge you know, cartography has its own challenges and there's all kinds of D3 components to deal with those challenges. Um, but if you're making a scatter plot, which is a scatter plot is kind of, I'll talk about scatter plots in a moment. It's sort of the basic thing that's really easy to do with D3, um, and you won't need all that. You won't need a force layout or dendrograms. Um, it does it does have a steep learning curve, though I would say. So it's not a um, you won't pick it up and just sort of be making these things immediately. There there is sort of a, a learning curve. Um, so in the second half of this presentation, sort of after a break, I'll go through some examples and show you some of the work I've done with uh, Michelle and, and Falk on EcoEngine. 
Um, and then in the second half, um, I'll sort of build an example from scratch. And <coughs> when I do that, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the specifics of D3. Um, yeah, but feel free to ask a question anytime. Um, so uh, there's tons of examples here, and we will come back to this page several times um, over the course of this talk. Another collaborator uh, on D3, especially on D3.geo and some of the more sophisticated um, layouts and projections that D3 has available um, is Jason Davies. Um, he has just some incredible examples. This is a spherical Voronoi. So this is, a, this is the globe, and uh, these are Voronoi cells um, with a, for airports. So, so this is a cell where <coughs> LF Wade International Airport is the closest airport to every point in this cell. Um, and Voronoi is normally on sort of just a, a flat uh, surface. So this is, this is on a spherical topology. Um, spherical, is that a spherical geometry. There is a big list of D3 examples uh, that Christoph Vio has made. There are literally thousands of examples. So, so Mike Bosak has created on his own hundreds, probably closer, probably more than a thousand, uh, but hundreds and hundreds of examples. And if you include the whole community um, collectively, we, we have created thousands and thousands of examples, literally thousands. Um, so on this page, there's 2,000. I think there's an updated list somewhere, because I know the, the number for this list should be closer to 3,000. Um, obviously, I'm not going to get to it all um, in this talk. I'm going to take a really specific sort of approach um, oriented around multidimensional data. So a really nice uh, multidimensional visualization. Um, hooked into the sound audio, great. This is the world distribution of income. Of people. This is Hans Rosling plot. One so, um, ten dollar. Let me skip ahead. He did this wonderful talk in two thousand seven. Wonderful South TED Asia talk where and um, Sub-Saharan Africa. The he was looking at um, different demographic properties of countries um, and comparing sort of fertility rates and life expectancy and, and female literacy um, across various nations and how that's changed um, from the nineteen sixties um, into the modern era and. Uh, it's this sort of animated bubble plot. So time is encoded as an animation um, in this plot. And it encodes several dimensions of data. Um, so we have a scatter plot where you can pick on the x and y axis uh, two dimensions. And so you could put life expectancy and fertility rate. Um, and then we have these, the size of these bubbles. So, so a normal scatter plot, they're just sort of equally sized marks. Uh, in this one, these bubbles are sized based on the population of the country or continent. Um, the color is the continent, so that's sort of a fourth encoding. Um, and then time encodes the fifth dimension, which is, which is the, 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 change, um, the change over time. So it's, and there's a D3 example of exactly this, this type of visualization. Uh, it's not labeled super well. Um, so to get sort of technical here, when, when we're talking about using D3, let's just see where my time is at. Um, the way that it works is, is you take a data structure. So let's say you have a, a CSV file, a table, and, and you bind. There, so there's many ways to do it, but this is, this is a, a sort of what's happening here. You bind a row of the data um, to uh, HTML elements, so elements that are, that are in a web document. So in this case, we're using. Uh, SVG, if we sort of inspect this page here, SVG in every country is a circle element. Um, so the data is bound to that element, all of the, all of the properties of that data. It's uh, the life expectancy in years for, for, for every year, um, and the, the population, and all these things change over time. And so, so D3 is, gives you a lot of tools. Um, for these kinds of animated transitions and, and specifying kind of how the, the visual encodings come out. The visual encodings actually come from SVG, which is um, scalable vector graphics. So it's, it's kind of a, um, it's its own sort of 
graphics technology. There's also HTML5 Canvas and, and normal HTML and WebGL. There's various uh, graphics technologies you can use in the browser. And most examples in D3 are SVG. So it's really oriented around that. So you're binding this data to these elements and then uh, changing some astra aspect of the visualization using quantitative scale. Um, so I, I use a more what I consider consistent sort of way to visualize multidimensional data. So that was up to five dimensions. And once you get past five, it gets harder and harder to add more. If you try to put seven in a visualization like that, um, you really start, you know, you've already used like the two sort of spatial dimensions in the screen and you've got color and size and um, you can get creative about it. Um, but why I came to D3 was this visualization. Uh, yeah. It is, yes. Um, you are not. D3 is, is, uh, generates that for you. Um, so in the second half of, I, I don't want to dig too much in the code here because you can really sort of spend a lot of time on the details. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it does. That's absolutely how it works. So it, it's generating SVG elements. Um, Okay, so parallel coordinates, this is, this is sort of a, this is a case study. So this is a specific visualization, and um, it's one that I've sort of taken and extended, and it's very useful for multidimensional visualization. How it works is, let's zoom in as much as we can here, is each of the dimensions in your data set um, become these uh, parallel axes. So these are all cars um, in this parallel coordinates, and every line going across, let me, let me see if I can find a single one. So every line going across is, is a car with its various attributes. So this, this car has eight cylinders. Um, it weighs uh, about 5,000 pounds. Um, it has all these properties, and um, it's kind of a multidimensional scatter plot. So it's a way to, so, so you could add as many uh, dimensions as you want, and every, every new dimension, and dimensions don't have to be the same units. We have horsepower, seconds, miles per gallon. In fact, every, every unit in this visualization is different. Um, time, number of cylinders. Um, and the advantage to this technique is, um, OK, and then we also have these range filters. So on each of these dimensions, we can put this range filter to, to drill into the data. Uh, because up here, it's sort of a cluttered mess. Um, but being able to sort of uh, drill in and see, um, see something specific is sort of the power the interactive power of this technique. Um, and the reason we plot them all as lines uh, rather than bars is just so we can overlay them and see trends when there, there's a lot of data. Um, so Protoviz, as I said, was the, um, this is the precursor to D3. It was based on this idea of uh, visual marks as the unit. So, so there are these, um, there are these marks and, and the marks then generate SVG um, the different thing about D3 is that it doesn't have uh, s sort of this concept of, of visual encodings as the primary thing. It just lets you access HTML directly. So really any web technology, which is, I mean, that's its own huge sort of organic thing, all the web technologies that are available. But you can access them all with D3. Um, and it makes it easier to do. Um, interactive transitions, um, sort of novel techniques. Uh, so Mike ported, ported parallel coordinates to, um, to D3. It's the same, same visualization. And this is sort of what I started with. I took it and um, applied it to the USDA uh, nutrient data set. So this is a data set. Maybe I should zoom in so you can read these labels a little bit. And see if I refresh the page if it lays out well. Uh, so this is a this is a data set um, curated by USDA. It has about eight thousand foods in it, and this is a this is a subset of the data, and it's uh, subsetted in two ways. So so the actual data set has about eight thousand foods in it, and this is only one thousand foods, uh, roughly. And the actual data set has one hundred and fifty 
dimensions, and this is only uh, 12 or 14 or something. So in a moment, I, I sort of iterated on this to show the entire data set. Um, but this was the first one I built, and I'm trying to sort of go chronologically here. Um, so let's grab a single food. So here we have potato sticks. They're, they're snacks. Um, and we read the visualization uh, the exact same way. So it's got, uh, we go across here, and wherever this line hits these axes, um, that's the value in this data table below. So a table table below is super valuable just to be able to see the contents of um, what you're interacting with. Um, so I spent some time on, with this, with this uh, visualization. Um, at one point, I ported it to HTML5 Canvas, which is um, this example to be able to render more data. There are some performance challenges with D3 when, you, when you're trying to plot a lot of data. Um, and it's, uh, it's not that fun to talk about, um, because it is sort of just sort of working around <laughs> the fact that some stuff happens to be slow. Um, but this is a way I could show the entire data set. And I just want to show sort of the big example of when you have a lot of dimensions in your data. Um, so this is one where I used a fisheye distortion. Let me turn off the distortion here. So this is um, almost the entire USDA nu nutrient database um, without some like dehydrated spices, because they were sort of outliers in, in the data. Th this is all per 100 grams of food. Um, if I did it per serving size, I think they wouldn't be outliers. But for 100 grams of food, like a spice is an incredibly dense <laughs> nutrient, uh, packet of nutrients. Um, so without any distortion, this graph is, oh, let me show the ticks. OK, so this is the graph with all the ticks and the labels, and it's, it's just a total, total mess. Um, but it's interactive. We add this distortion, um, and it sort of just peels apart. How the fisheye distortion works is kind of gives you this sort of Rolodex thing where you can zoom into a particular area. And then the er interaction that I added to make it usable is you can click on a food, and the dimensions reorder themselves um, so that the scaled y value of this food is always decreasing. Um, and so here we have beef, and it's got, I can't read water here. This beef uh, has 60 grams of water in it, 2.2 uh, grams of lysine, um, a bunch of amino acids. Um, if we had the ticks here. Is all this data stored in a table cache, or is it dynamically pulling it from like an API? This is all just in the browser, all happening here. So, yeah. Roughly, how many increments of 40 hours do you think? Um, that is a that's a good question. Maybe, I will maybe six or seven, but spread out over a couple of years. Um, it's sort of my my it's my garden, you know. I go to work on this every once in a while. In, in the future, I'd like actually to, as I said, make it all scaled to serving size. Um, and then I'm, I don't represent null data very well, so I'd like to get better at representing null data because um, it, it's it's a fairly sparse data set. There's a lot of if we go over here, there's a lot of specialized fats, and so USDA doesn't collect data on those fats for every food. Um, there's interesting foods in here. There's like, I think there may be walrus. Yeah, here we go, walrus meat. Um, ethnic foods are, are like, uh, like a lot of Alaskan native foods. So there, there's also various whales, beluga whale oil, flipper, and liver and stuff. Um, but this is a technique. Is um, is parallel coordinates. So, so in this idea of D3, just sort of connecting back to D3, kind of the, 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 the element we're working with that we're, we're binding the data to are these lines that would go across these polylines. And the attribute, the visual attribute is um, at each dimension, it's, it's where it intersects. Um, so if you're interested in using D3, um, I've turned this into um, a library that sort of works more generically with um, just sort of lots of types of data. Um, you can drop in a CSV file, and it, it should should sort of work. So it's a kind of this reusable chart um, style, and it's a good place just to sort of explore what is in your data that might be an interesting visual encoding to make um, some other type of visualization. Um, 
And lastly, sort of to connect it back to um, what I want to talk about is how I used uh, D3 um, to collaborate with people with, with people here at Berkeley um, on the EcoEngine API, which is a, a collection of um, observations, um, uh, sort of in an, in an API that that unifies them by space and time, so you can query um, using these sort of range filters. Um, So dimensions of the data here, we have observation type, country, um, begin and end date, which uh, actually, if you see this pattern, sort of these lines that suggest that they're strongly linear related, actually these two dimensions are identical except for um, these outliers right here. Um, so that's the idea. So let me show you some EcoEngine examples. Um, So each datum is a, let's see, these are checklists. Um, let me run a query here. So in general, the datum is a um, specimen observation. It's got a scientific name, um, a country. Sometimes it has a geocoordinate, um, and it has a time that the observation was made. Um, <coughs> And so uh, with Stamen and, and uh, Berkeley, we um, made sort of these tools, uh, this is with Leaflet, to um, explore these specimen observations. Um, so one of the issues we ran up w against um, sort of in making this exploration tool, um, and that I we use a D3 technique to sort of start creating a solution for, um, is that when you plot these sort of marks in Leaflet, uh, they can end up on top of each other. So we have this sort of uh, perceptual error, which is this error of occlusion, because we have just a bunch of circles, and they have n there's no way to see behind them. Um, you could add some opacity. There are some tricks you could do. Um, but it's hard to tell uh, the density of, I mean, you, you can tell that they're dense here, but exactly how dense, that's the question. Because um, we're trying to you know, sort of be as quantitatively accurate as we can in visualization. Um, so some techniques that. Oh, sorry, Leaflet is a is a slippy map um, sort of tool. Slippy map, so it's slippy in that you can sort of slip around like this. Um, so Leaflet is generally always um, on a Mercator projection. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a short sidetrack into D3.geo uh, while we're on Leaflet. So if we zoom out all the way here, so you'll see I always like to sort of scroll down here just to see how sort of grotesquely distorted Antarctica is. So Antarctica is just sort of like pinned like a frog like to the bottom of the map. I mean, Antarctica, right, if you saw it from space, it doesn't look like that. Um, and there's no way to change the way it looks, really, in Leaflet. It's, it's just like that. It's the Mercator projection. Um, so D3.geo, which is um, a fairly, I mean, it, it's, uh, it has its own sort of learning curve. Um, See if I can find a transitions example here. Is this it? Um, allows for dynamic projections. So here, so what Leaflet does is it's pulling tile layers. So it's pulling uh, actual raster images, PNGs, off of a server that um, have been pre-rendered for that location. So we've got the streets of London. And as you zoom in, it gives you perhaps tiles with more detail. And it sort of fills them out as squares. And as you slip around, it knows which squares it needs to get and, and puts the squares. Um, with the D3, we can pass in um, the geometry as data. So, so here, the countries are um, a format called GeoJSON, um, similar to a shape file. There seems to be some bug in the transition here. Uh, some of the lines get a little weird. Um, It could have been done using D3GO. And in fact, I will show a couple examples that were done with uh, D3GO. Yeah. So I just want to say one sentence about this, and that is if you see this for the first time, you go, that 
that's impossible. I've never seen anyone else do that. You're right. It's very, very difficult. This created quite a stir when you published it. And the point is that mathematically, when you move from one projection to another or in, within some projections, you get these startling extremes. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing is there's a second set in the back that is smoothing out those extremes and then picking the pixels that will be shown on the screen. And Mike Bostock gave a talk about how he originally, or, whoever, or Jason, whoever did that. They, they really collaborated together on this. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. gave a talk about it because this was very startling and some people may be seeing this for the first time. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they spent probably a year and a half really sort of innovating on D3.geo. It had, D3 always had um, geographic sort of mapping capabilities. I'm trying to find the simplification. But there were all kinds of techniques um, that they created to uh, s sort of, there, I mean, there's all kinds of geographic problems with, with projecting a sphere. Um, one of the things they solved was just, just sort of rendering uh, the correct level of detail when you have um, a shape file where maybe the coastline is just way too detailed. and. If the detail is smaller than a pixel, it, it's pointless to render that detail. Um, and so this is just one example. It's a line simplification algorithm uh, that just simplifies uh, geometry and compresses it. So, so this geometry, it looks roughly the same as this. Uh, it loses you know, quite a bit of detail. Um, but if it was zoomed out, it would be OK. And, and it's only 1.5% the size. Um, so there's all kinds, of, all kinds of things like that. I mean, Lots of innovative things that they've done. Um, so this is an example with D3.geo. This is not a, um, this is just the Albers projection. So it's not actually that different than Mercator. Um, and it's not interactive. But what, we, what I used here was the um, D3 Hexbin plugin. So let me just have that here. So again, I think it's all about sort of reducing the error in your representation. Um, so one type of error that we were just sort of talking about is projection error, the way that um, geographic projections distort angles and areas. Um, when you are talked about errors of occlusion, when you just are sort of plotting points and they end up on top of each other, really telling how many are there. Um, binning is a way to sort of accurately represent the quantity of data in a particular cell. Um, a problem with square bins is that uh, square bins are not sort of uh, symmetric in terms of their adjacencies. So there's, there's four squares um, that are close to each square. And then you know, they're adjacent to eight squares, but four are on a diagonal, and four are right next to each other. So they have this sort of lack of um, symmetry. And hexagons um, have a symmetry of, adja of adjacency. Um, and it, they just look cool. So I. Um, decided to try to use them with the Eco Engine. So in this example, um, we just have, I, I got all of the um, observations that were geocoded of western fence lizards and dusky footed wood rats. And we're just interested in the co-occurrence of species. Um, and so I worked from Mike's bivariate hexpin example um, to create this. And uh, sort of the only interaction here is that you can toggle on and off these layers. And when you toggle on and off these layers, it's actually smoothly transi transitioning all of the hexagons. It's not just swapping back and forth between two layers or, ha or having, um, th there's not just two layers that are on top of each other. It's actually sort of combining the data and um, th there's a color scale uh, sort of shows the core current. So, so it's actually gray here. So you can see, see these ones when, when we just have wood rats on, this, this cell is red. And we turn on lizards as well, it turns, um, turns gray. So that's just sort of a, a simple example application of this technique. Um, a couple others that we did. And these ones may take a while to load, so um, I have some screenshots if, if they don't load. OK, let me just go to my screenshots. So these are, well, can you, how big is EcoEngine?
Yeah, so this is, uh, this is one. So this is, this is one that's on a non-traditional, uh, it's on a non-mercator projection. Um, and it should be loading. Can I not? Can I not change my, oh, here we go. Should be loading here. So, so here's the first about 3,000 observations. Um, but I just let it run for a little while and, and got 100,000 observations, because I'm just curious where in the world uh, eco-engine observations end up. And I found these, um, I think these are uh, these fish observations just sort of around Antarctica. Um, and they create this nice arc in this projection, um, which right in a Mercator projection would sort of be, you know, sort of deformed into this kind of clump. Um, and so that, that's one possibility. Uh, this is from the Arctic. So, so this is Antarctica. This is uh, the Arctic. And it looks uh, a little different. There's a huge sampling bias uh, in California, of course. Cause, um, so another technique we, we tried out was this uh, small multiples. So a lot of times when people think of maps, they think of these sort of full screen maps um, and overlaid layers. So another technique in multidimensional visualization is you use simple visualizations, but you show many of them uh, side by side to invite comparison. Um, so in this case, we have um, the Quercus genus, oak trees, and uh, uh, there's a great sort of biodiversity, uh, many different species that all overlap in California. Um, and so you could, so to sort of see the, the, the differences, um, we're using these little hex bins, and you can't really see the outline of California. This is the California coast, right along here. Here's another. So this is more. Um, this, these aren't really range maps. These are um, sort of just kind of information richness in, in the API. So if you search these in the API, this, these are these are the results you get. Um, so San Francisco is uh, up here, and LA is down here. Hi. Yeah. Um, is this just a visualization of co-occurrence, or is it to aid in um, searching and downloading data? Um, so when I made this, I did add one for, for searching data. Um, so the Quercus one actually has a secret. Oh, and. This dusky footed wood rats over decades is just an example of small multiples. So small multiples, you can get creative about which one is. And so in this, uh, in this case, um, instead of splitting it out by species, it's, split, it's the same species over and over again, but split out by time to see a temporal distribution. Um, so to answer your question, uh, there is a secret search on the Quercus page. Um, you can put in a search term here. What, what's something? We could search from EcoEngine. Put Tarika. Uh, so we can put Tarika and uh, split it by scientific name. Hopefully it'll load with some, with some uh, haste. <laughs> um, I hope I didn't have, let me see if I'm get getting an error here. I'm not, so I'm just waiting. <laughs> Um, this is actually from the EcoEngine API, which right. uh, Falk built. Uh, so this, yeah, it's, uh, they are still on our dev server, so which is just an M1 Kingdom Central API. AWS, their production server is much more powerful, but it's a it's good live stuff in there. Can you say something about what data is being transferred to the local tree and expanding the server on the local tree? Um, yeah, so, so in this case, um, and why these sort of take a little while to load. We're getting a page of data from the EcoEngine API. So I will show you exactly what that looks like. It looks like, and in fact, we can run that exact, let's just run that query on the EcoEngine API. So the way the EcoEngine API works is um, it just takes these query parameters in the URL. Um, and so we can put our Tarika query here. Um, and you get back a, a JSON, JavaScript object notation data structure. Um, it gives you the counts of the number of observations um, that are in the EcoEngine API, so 11,000. And then gives you an array of results. Um, and each one of these results is, um, is an observation. And then what's happening um, in these hexagon examples, 
Uh, so it is loading. Maybe if we come back to it in a second, it'll um, load up a little bit. So what's happening in the hexagon examples is it's then um, doing the hexagonal binning um, in the browser and, and sizing the hexagons based on the number of observations at that location. So this, so this JSON information is coming to your local. It is. Yes, yeah, so you're getting data, and it looks exactly, it is this data. Yes. So I noticed there's a GeoJSON uh, entry there. Are you actually using GeoJSON interoperably with, say, some of the other GeoPython or GeoJavaScript? Do you, do you take the GeoJSON itself and, and move that around as its own thing? Right. Um, right that's what's happening in, when, in that uh, example with Leaflet. So, that, so this one page, hopefully I didn't close it. So in this one page, actually, this one just happens to be built almost all with V3. Um, but this map is leaflet, and it, it uses GeoJSON in sort of a kind of standard. Did you have to massage it to when you pass the data, or did it just work? Just what you got, you passed, and it worked? I'm sure I had to massage it. I don't remember exactly That's what. That's what I'm trying to get out of you, yeah. There is a lot of data massaging, uh, and it's a, an unglamorous part of um, data science and visualization. But it is an important part, um, because it's it's normally quite rare that the data is in exactly the format you need. Um, so those were a couple of techniques that were, were applied. Um, <coughs> yeah, the good thing about supporting the hex binning within the address mm -hmm. is the actual values for the hex binning. Right, exactly. Um, So I guess, I w so I would say, um, so those are just, you know, just a couple examples from this huge page of examples um, that I worked from to create, to create these, these, um, these plots in Eco Engine. And so um, D3 is just incredibly rich in the number of techniques that have been demonstrated. Um, to create visualizations that have um, minimal error, if you're willing to go out and find right, all of the techniques um, to minimize the error in your representation. Um, and also to, to sort of encode um, multidimensional data in, in many ways, whether it's with small multiples or, um, or parallel coordinates. Or um, another technique is linked visualization, so actually I go back to my blocks here. So in this example, these bar charts below, um, just with the distribution of selected foods. And so as I interact with uh, this chart, um, this linked visualization provides a little extra context. And so D3 is very good about uh, it's tricky to do. It's not. It just doesn't come out of the box. You have to figure out how it works. Um, but um, once you figure it out, it is easy to create these kind of linked views to take the take advantage of the strengths of two visualizations. That um, you know, whether it's a it could be a scatter plot in a map, um, right? To understand sort of the relation of the quantitative data with the with the spatial relationships uh, the data contains. Um, and so that, that that's it. That's the it's sort of a, a brief overview of uh, how to use D3 to visualize multidimensional data. Um, so I'll take a couple questions. If anyone needs to go, go ahead. And then I will do a, in the second half, I'm going to do an example from scratch. And so the DOM, DOM is the document object model. Yeah. So, so on a web, website. Um, then it comes with like this not really the visualization, but the probability of this new thing. Mm -hmm. so it could basically, what, if someone knows jQuery, whatever you can do in jQuery, you can do also in D3 without even getting to graphics. You can also just build up normal tables or normal, uh, like order list or unordered list, like normal. JavaScript uh, DOM manipulating uh, actions. That's what they do in D3. And then you have like all this crazy uh, 
and there's there's some just purely functional stuff that it that it has, which are just straight up data transformations and um, things like layouts, force layouts, and geographic projections are exactly that. A geographic projection is just a function that takes a um, longitude latitude latitude pair and gives you an x y coordinate to to uh, plot that point on the screen. Um, Yeah. Uh, would there be any reasons for anybody not to use D3? Now, I say that I'll preempt that by saying I, I like D3 most of the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the reasons could be maybe the community is there's only just that, that person in life and he's like put the group on to do a lot of stuff. Uh, or, or it's computationally intensive on the browser, uh, load times, these kind of things that prevent it to be. Um. I mean, so, so in my work, I'm always super interested in speeding things up so that it is sort of performative. Um, so, an example, so an example like this is loading 8,000 points across these 16 dimensions. Um, and I have, uh, I have some techniques that, that you can find if you Google it for sort of this uh, progressive loading. So, so it throws all the data on a stack and then renders it in chunks. And, and it's just sort of an easy way just to render a bunch of data. It, it can render a couple hundred thousand. Um, data points no problem and it and it works for any it works for a scatter plot or a geographic map uh, there's a, this sort of mathematical thing with d3 once you figure it out you figure out that um, techniques can sort of be recombined and applied in different ways um, and that takes some intuition that that just comes with with learning it um, I would say if you um, it's really about building custom sort of visualizations and representations so if you if you need something there's not a tool out there for it D3 is a great toolkit um, to build that yourself. Um, if there are good tools for, for working with it and you really just, um, you know, just you need a visualization tool to quickly explore the data, it might take a long time to sort of learn D3. And uh, there, there is quite a significant learning curve. Um, and so I, I think it's worth doing, though, because it, it unlocks a lot of functionality that you can apply to your work. I would say, it, I would say it is the de facto sort of visualization community, just in terms of the quantity and quality of examples um, and, and people in the community. I mean, um, I would say Mike and Jason really are sort of at the forefront of the community, and then there are hundreds of people like me who who dabble and and uh, use it in our work. Um, I, I was just showing, showing some examples of uh, Sarah Quigley, for example, who. Um, works at the university and does a lot of work with Sankey diagrams, which are um, another excellent visualization. They're useful. So these data structures called trees, which are these hierarchies. Um, a Sankey diagram is sort of a more, plots a more generic version of a tree. It can be a graph with sort of cyclic connections. Um, so it could plot a tree. That's, that, that is sort of a subset of what a Sankey could do. But it can also sort of um, show connections that, um, you know, so this, this too has a financial block. And there's two things that are problematic um, in this collection of uh, cases where students have financial blocks. And um, these two problematic things could both be solved by this one solution. And so that's just an example of um, so the Sankey diagram, actually. This is one of Mike's interactive essays, is, is this Sankey diagram example. This one is about the quantity of. Um, energy flow between nodes in a network. Um, so where energy is, is lost. So it looks like a lot of nuclear energy is, uh, produces energy by thermal generation, and a lot of it is lost to heat or whatever. Um, and then looks like 40% of it makes it to the electricity grid. And then some of it goes to district heating. Um, anyway, so Sarah Quigley is, is uh, and there weren't a lot of examples of Sankey diagrams, but Sankey, Sarah Quigley just wanted to make these uh, Sankey diagrams um, to show sort of information about the student body at Berkeley. Um, and so almost anyone who learns, um, you know, is trying to use a Sankey diagram eventually stumbles upon Sarah's work because um, 
it's, it's just helpful to learn from a variety of examples from different people, um, and especially well-designed examples um, like this one, where the, where the information is communicated effectively. Um, and the, I mean, that's what I really like about the community. Yeah. Um, so Canvas has mouse events, but the only thing you get are the x, y coordinates. So a lot of times that is enough to create interactions um, if you have projected the data in a way that is invertible. Um, so this is a just kind of mathy, nerdy thing. So here, so I do have several examples of Canvas interactions in my blocks. It's kind of one of my my things. Um, so this is super nerdy, but uh, so. For selecting on a canvas globe, this is a canvas globe, and when you hover over a country, it highlights the country. And the globe is rotating and stuff, and there is no, so this is only interesting to people who know a little bit about D3, there are no SVG elements there for mouse over events. Um, so the trick in this visualization is that I've plotted, um, there should be a hidden here just, just so I could talk about it. Um, I've plotted all of the countries in an equal rectangular projection, just a static equal rectangular projection. And I've given them, given them all a different shade of red. So there's only 200 and some countries, so they can all get one shade of red. Um, and I have actually an object that can go from a shade of red to the country and know what country it is. So when I put the mouse anywhere here, what I do is I invert the projection and then find that point <laughs> in the equal rectangular projection, and then see what color red that pixel is. And then I know what country it is, and I can highlight it in the map up here. Um, so as I said, it's a, it's a mathematical thing. And once you uh, realize that any um, projection you can invert, you can go back to sort of the, you can sort of look up the source data. It's the same with bins. So hex bins, you can also look up which bin it's in. Um, and then a more sophisticated technique actually is quad trees. Um, so is this a quad tree example? These are minimum bounding boxes. Um, anyways, qu quad trees are a way to sort of spatially index the data um, to do a fast lookup. So you can quickly find what is the closest point um, to another point. So it's. Uh, so it's not necessary to, to use SVG to get interactions, uh, but it does take more work. Here's a quad tree search. So this is finding, I think, the closest six or seven um, points, and it's doing it um, algorithmically. And so this example down here, um, you can use this example, the algorithm in this example. Super simple. There's actually a quad tree module. Um, and all you have to do is, is specify this visit function. Um, And so there's examples of how to do it. Any other questions? OK, cool. Let's take, a, let's take a short break and then try to build something from scratch from on the EcoEngine API. Um, let's say two, two three minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes? So we realize some people probably have to leave at 2 o'clock, but if you want to stick around uh, in two minutes, we're going to show a demo uh, about how you can build something like this.